Hi, my name is Meredith Kahn, and I'm the chair of the Professional Development Committee for the Library uh, Publishing Coalition, and welcome everyone to uh, another webinar sponsored by the LPC and uh, arranged by the Professional Development Committee. These events, and they can be viewed uh, on the LPC's YouTube channel later. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, so our special guest today is Nancy Sims the Copyright Program Librarian at the University of Minnesota, and she'll be discussing getting your copyright ducks in a row. Um, Nancy is the University of Minnesota Library's subject specialist on copyright issues. She's both a librarian with significant experience in academic libraries and a lawyer fascinated by the pervasiveness of copyright issues in modern life. She's also kind of a superstar. Um, Nancy's job isn't to be the copyright police on campus, but rather to help individuals and groups throughout the university community understand how copyright might affect their work. She provides education through the university's copyright website, workshops, and small group and individual consultations. And in her role, Nancy works within and outside the university to advocate for policies and practices that support sustainable scholarship, democratic information access, and wide public, sorry, wide public cultural participation. Um, you can learn more about uh, the University of Minnesota's Library Copyright Services, uh, read Nancy's blog, or follow her on Twitter. Um, and we've got some links we can share with folks in the chat box. Um, after Nancy's talk, uh, we'll have time, time for some Q&A, and uh, you can ask those questions using the chat box. Uh, it should be in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. So having said that, I am going to turn it over to Nancy. Thank you very much for that inf uh, great introduction. Um, it's always fun to hear which pieces of my website bio people choose to read. I think that was almost all of it. So thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned on uh, my Facebook page this morning, letting me title this presentation, Getting Your Copyright yes. Ducks in a Row, people must have anticipated that there would be some ducks. So there's some ducks, and I uh, apologize to anybody who finds that too frivolous, but I like a little bit of frivolity here. Um, my goals for today, and I hope these are goals that you share, are to do a bit of an overview of a fairly wide variety of copyright issues that may come up for library publishers. Um, I am trying to keep in mind that there may be a range of institutions behind a library publisher, and uh, I'm try also trying to keep in mind that there may be a range of goals and audiences that any given publisher is working with. Um, but because I'm trying to do all of those things, it's necessarily fairly high level. There may be some um, narrower things that people will want to dig in on, and, and you're welcome to ask questions. Uh, because I'm sharing my screen, I'm actually not sure I can see hand raising, uh, so I, I'm not quite sure how we'll do that, but I will pause and and uh, maybe flip out of screen sharing from time to time to check on things. So, um, and sort of an outline for where where I'm hoping to go with this. A um, few preliminary issues, more to do with uh, who you are and uh, some basics of how copyright works. Um, and then the rest of this I'm intending to sort of focus on, as I said, a range of copyright issues um, we sort of uh, split out by uh, populations you may be working with. So issues that may come up in partnerships with groups, um, in particular like sets of journal editors or a group of people running a conference or something like that. Um, some issues that may come up with individual authors. Uh, some issues related to third parties materials. So works that are that belong to somebody who's not somebody who's working with you. Um, more about that when we get there. And uh, finally, briefly, uh, some of the ways that copyright may be part of your, um, may present issues related to how you, how you interact with the public. Uh, you will note uh, that one of the ways that I'm addressing open licensing throughout is that all of the illustrations I'm using in the background for this presentation are themselves Creative Commons licensed, which you may note down at the bottom of the page. Uh, try to keep the citations correct, but every once in a while they get mixed up. Um, and I will talk more about that as we go forward as well. <clears throat> so one set of preliminaries is just a couple of really basic things about copyright that are not always obvious. So one is that the verb to copyright 
is largely meaningless and has been since at least the late 1970s in the United States. Copyright comes into existence at the moment that a work is created. And uh, hopefully that's not news to anybody who's heavily involved in running a library publishing service, but if you're just getting off the ground, it may be, and, and that's, that's um, pretty reasonable for it to be news. It will definitely be news to many of the authors and editors and other folks that you may end up working with. So very roughly, uh, the sort of implications of that that are most important to really grasp are that in the absence of information to the contrary, you should assume someone owns things. Uh, because copyright is a legal right that comes into existence when a creative work comes into existence, unless you have reason to believe that nobody owns it, you should assume there is an owner. And reason to believe nobody owns it would be uh, you know enough about the public domain to identify that there is no copyright in the work, or you know enough about the work to know that uh, it belongs to somebody who has given you permission or something like that. Uh, the biggest issue here is that I do f still find quite a few um, faculty members or researchers who, who think that because they found something freely available online, that publicly available and public domain are the same thing. Uh, and that publicly online things have no owner, which is not true. Another implication of the automatic nature of copyright for library publishing is that usually rights come into existence automatically, and usually they belong to the creator of the work. If the creator is creating on the job, and it's part of their job to do that, which is to say most university employees, most um, creative workers whose, whose job is uh, creative production, uh, the employer by default does actually own their work, usually. In the academic world, there is usually some sort of policy that identifies uh, scholars as owners of their scholarship. That functions in a lot of different ways, and the specifics of that are not worth going into, but the end result is that uh, usually if you're working with authors who are academics, even though their employer may, uh, by the default rule of law, uh, own their work, they usually do have a legal right to tr behave as if they own it and to sign contracts and those sorts of things. If you are working with people who are employees of other organizations, you might need to dig a little deeper to find out who is allowed to sign contracts about use of materials that that person produced. Finally, uh, registration is not a necessary thing to own a copyright. Copyright happens automatically. Uh, registration can be useful. Registration um, is, in one way, an indicator of legitimacy for a publication. So somebody who's running a journal or publishing a book may want to register for those reasons. It's relatively cheap to register a single work online. Um, it gets more expensive if you're registering a bunch of stuff or if you need to use other forms. Um, so registration, there's some good reasons to do it. Uh, there's some benefits if you ever go to litigation, but it's not necessary to be a copyright owner. It's an optional thing. I'm going to keep moving a little bit faster here on these preliminaries. Uh, where you are, where your authors are, and where your audience is, is relevant to copyright. If you are working in the United States, U.S. law is the most important stuff for you to be aware of. But if you are working in the United States with authors from other countries or working in the United States um, and elsewhere, uh, U.S. law is not the only thing you need to be aware of. If you are actively working outside of the United States, if there are um, offices located overseas, you're going to need to know that jurisdiction's law on some points. And to make all of this, the large lease there, you know, being a lawyer, pulling, pulling myself out of making categorical statements, um, even in the U.S., international law can sometimes be relevant, and even in other jurisdictions, you can't necessarily be certain that that jurisdiction is the law that you need to know about. Uh, but very roughly speaking, where you're physically located is probably the law you need to know the best. Which brings us to that last bullet point, which is online. Um, because online is not really located anywhere. 
Uh, for the most part, the biggest issues with respect to jurisdiction about online issues do have to do with where your servers are. But uh, in these days with cloud computing um, for, you know, backup processing and hosting growing quickly, even that's not as settled as it used to be. I would actually, if since most of us are working primarily online, I would say that actually the way things are right now, it's probably true that even for online publications, where you are working is probably the most important thing. There are some things about your institution that will affect how you pro proceed legally. Uh, one really, really big thing is, is your institution actually part of a United States state government? The University of Minnesota is. We are an arm of the state government. Um, but there are sometimes universities that sound like uh, they belong to the state government that don't and, and vice versa. Um, that's relevant largely because states have some protections against legal issues that other um, that other entities don't. So if your if your institution is an arm of the state government, you could you can definitely uh, ask your general counsel if that has any implications for some of the things you might need to deal with with them. Uh, another thing that will affect legal issues is: Are you a nonprofit? I'm going to assume that most of the people on the call today are nonprofits. Um, just because that's a lot easier, but also because I don't think there are a whole lot of for-profit schools that are doing library publishing. Could be wrong. Um, whether your institution is private or public is probably not that important, much more so whether it's nonprofit or not. And um, I'm going to, again, assume this is true of most of the people on the call, but institutions with educational or scholarly missions are going to have certain advantages on um, some of the legal issues related to copyright that may come up. Last preliminary, there are some institutional variables that affect things to do with copyright and library publishing that are in your control. So um, they have to do with what your mission is and what the scope of your work is. One really important question is who do you work with? Uh, is your library publishing service working only with people affiliated with your institution? Um, and that actually simplifies a lot of things for your institution's lawyers. If they're already part of your organization, a lot of the, the things, I, I'll bring up things like uh, allocation of risk later, who, who is risking what. If everybody you're working with is internal to your university or to some other organization, that's a much less important issue because everybody's already part of the same organization. If you are working with a lot of people who have no affiliation with your institution, things are there's going to be a lot more where you need to make more solid agreements to plan ahead. And then another variable that is entirely in your control is when you publish, are you publishing only open? Uh, is everything you publish openly published? And by open here, I mean uh, publicly available online and licensed for reuse. Um, are you doing some sort of mixture of publicly available online, but some of them are not licensed for reuse, uh, publicly available online, but not none of them are licensed for reuse. Uh, and then another element of, of mixed would be if you have some open and some that are actually closed where people uh, don't get access unless they surmount some sort of barrier. I know some library publishers are working with groups where they have they have materials that are only available to members of a certain group. Um, and I know, I believe that some folks, I am actually not 100% certain on this, but I believe that some folks are working with uh, publications where someone wants to charge money for the publication. If you are working with works that are closed and payment is an element of how people get access, it will also be relevant whether the payments that you have to deal with, uh, whether you have to deal with them at all, are they going to be processed somewhere else? Um, and then whether those are revenue uh, payments for a nonprofit or if they actually are some sort of profit making enterprise. Those will all affect things. So um, I would like to pause and invite questions. Uh, I don't quite know what will happen if I stop sharing my screen. Oh, there, I have the chat button there. Got it. OK, so if anybody wants to send chats, uh, you are welcome to send chats with questions. Now I can see them. Also going to take a moment 
to take a sip of water here. Okay. Also, I would ask if you submit a question um, via the chat, uh, if you can submit to everybody, is that possible? Well, maybe not. Well, feel free to set. Oh, yeah, there's everyone at the top. Um, if you can submit to everyone, that would be awesome because that is. Uh, oh, there we go. Charlotte just did that. What are some resources for international copyright? Well, um, off the top of my head, I would say go to law school and take a class in international law before you start trying to understand international copyright. That's not particularly productive information, but um, actually, IFLA, the, uh, the I don't remember what that stands for. The International Library Group has some people doing some really good work on international copyright issues, not specific to publishing, but definitely some folks who are really, really smart about international copyright. Um, I think Kenny Cruz's book about copyright issues in libraries has some um, some information about international issues, but there's a, there's a lot that underlies international law that's not just copyright. Um, so I don't off the top of my head have an international copyright book that I would point you right to immediately. But uh, IFLA and maybe Kenny's book and uh, yeah, off the top of my head, I don't have anything else to immediately share. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, feel free to throw up questions at any point here. So I'm going to uh, move on from preliminaries into this more relational stuff. Um, and this is the biggest chunk of the relational stuff. When you are uh, working with people as a library publisher, and I'm not, I'm obviously a little bit skewed by my experiences working with the University of Minnesota Library Publishing Group, um, we tend to be working with groups. So we've been working with a group that's starting a journal or a group that's transitioning some existing resource into a new. So um, my my impression is that most of the time library publishing involves working with some kind of a group or organization to produce a work and that it's a little bit less common to be working directly with an individual author. But that's the next slide set after this one. So partnerships is the biggest part of what I, what I intend to talk about today. If you are working with a group of people on some sort of publication, you should have some kind of service level agreement, memorandum of understanding, whatever you want to call it, you should have some kind of legal or semi-legal document that you sit down and go through with those people at the outset of your relationship. Um, a lot of things should be in that document, and many of them are things that have nothing to do with copyright at all, and many of them are things that other people in the Library Publishing Coalition are much better set up to talk about than I am. Uh, but as an example, a few of the things that are in our agreement with some of our partners are... How's that looking for people? It looks great. We can see your screen. Thank you very much. Okay. So here are some, uh, I think this is picking up where I left off. Here are some rights that you should be talking about in your agreement. Um, you should be talking about how you and the partner will uh, agree about distribution rights. Uh, there is a third layer here, which is whether the partner will be um, getting the distribution rights from the authors or whether they will be giving the rights directly to you or how that will work. Um, I have that on another slide. But you need some kind of agreement with your partner, uh, with the partner group, about how uh, distribution rights will work. It is easiest if everybody just shares broad rights. That is not necessarily the best approach for any particular one situation, but administratively easy to say you have, you know, whoever owns the originating rights can keep all of the originating rights. Let's just make sure that the library publishing group also has all of the rights um, and you can agree in contracts to just say that that uh, you can agree in a contract to just say that everybody will will more or less have every right related to copyright that is administratively easy um, there are lots of reasons why that might not work for any given group but that is probably the easiest thing to deal with if your organization or if the partner organization needs some exclusivity that is they need to be the only owners of certain rights that is going to be something that will make it more complicated. Um, 
there is a very interesting set of roadblocks to setting up this kind of an agreement with a partner group, which is that even if your partner group is an editorial board for a journal, um, sometimes they will feel uncomfortable sharing rights at all. Uh, and that's just something you kind of have to talk through and work on as a relationship development thing. At, you know, whether you decide everybody will have all the rights, be a big communist like Nancy, or whether you decide we will have certain rights and you will have certain rights and we're going to keep those separate, um, you definitely, since your organization is the distributor, you definitely need some level of distribution rights. So if they are feeling uncomfortable about sharing rights, you know, at some point they are going to have to give you some kind of rights. There's another layer involved here, which is that sometimes your organization that you're working with will be uncomfortable sharing rights with you, whoever you is. I'm making little finger quotes in the air here. Um, as far as the University of Minnesota publishing arm of the libraries works, as far as all of this organizational structure works, we are technically, legally, the University of Minnesota. And some people, including people who work here, are uncomfortable with the idea of giving the university rights. Um, that's a different challenge. Uh, again, it's a relationship management challenge. Um, it, it usually reflects some sort of poor experience in the past or knowing someone who has had a poor experience in the past. And I do think it's something that can be easily mitigated by pointing out that, yes, it's the university, but it's the library. We're good people. All right, since we lost some time, I'm going to try to keep moving forward here. So one issue here in your partnership, sometimes the organization has some copyrights that you need rights to share. Sometimes there is this extra layer. There are authors who start out owning their copyrights, and you need some rights to distribute their work. Um, who will actually have the rights from the authors? Where, where will that sharing happen? Um, it's possible to set it up, and this can be set up in your service level agreement. You can agree that your partner organization will get the rights from the authors, and then your agreement with the partner organization will be how you deal with um, all the author's rights. That can, that can be it. Or if your partner organization does not want to deal with legal transfers or legal licenses, you could have all the authors work directly with you. Totally, you know, there's many good reasons why either one of those might work well. Or you can uh, even skip a step and say, well, the authors don't have to give us any specific rights. The authors just have to give everybody in the world rights. Um, and we will, we will make use of those the same way anyone else does. Um, that's actually sometimes quite legally easy because granting a Creative Commons license is as easy as the owner saying, I'm granting a Creative Commons license. You don't necessarily have to execute a separate legal agreement if you want to use Creative Commons as the tool for your authors to grant rights for distribution. That's an option. Um, will your authors be required to give up any rights? Uh, will your authors be required to give up all rights? Um, it is traditionally Traditionally true that authors usually get, give all their rights to the publisher, and then the publisher uh, sometimes agrees to grant some of them back to the authors. Um, that's a very broad generalization. Uh, on a related question here is, you know, there's not just will the authors be required to give up rights, but will you allow your partners to require that authors will give up rights? Um, is that something where you have, you know, I know some library publishing groups, openness is a, is a stated value of the program. And if openness is a stated value of the program, um, will you allow people that you work with to require that authors relinquish rights? Or will you just say, if you want to work with us, this has to be a situation where authors get to keep their rights? That's, uh, that's something to work out. Um, also to work out whether there will need to be any exclusivity or embargo periods, whether there might be times when you need exclusive rights for a certain period or the, or the partner organization needs rights from authors for an exclusive period. Uh, another thing to think about in your partnerships is how you will allocate risks. Um, so this is different than an agreement that um, here's I'm the owner of these copyrights and I'm sharing them with you. Different issue now. We're talking about 
who's going to be willing to take on risks of lawsuits related to copyrights? Um, generally speaking, you might not need to go down this path at all. This kind of discussion, allocation of risk discussion, is a discussion that is much more important when the people who will be producing the content are not part of the same organization. Um, will you be asking your partner to provide any guarantees that the materials they're giving you are suitable for a particular purpose? Will you be asking them to indemnify you? Indemnification would mean that you are asking them to agree that they will pay legal costs if, if you get sued. Um, that's a very big shorthand. Um, are you going to have any requirement that they carry insurance for things like copyright issues? All of those are things that most of the people working in the library publishing world will not be able to afford to do. Um, guarantees don't cost money exactly, but um, a promise to indemnify is pointless if the group that is going to indemnify you won't have any money anyway, and bringing it up and discussing it might just make everybody feel bad. So you might not want to go down the line of discussing these, but these are things that a standard lawyer is going to bring up in, some, in a partnership agreement about copyrighted content. Um, related to things like guarantees, will you set out rules for your library publishing group about what kinds of permissions you require, uh, what kinds of permissions or licenses you allow, etc.? Will you say that anybody who is using anything that doesn't belong to them must always have permissions? That is actually a fairly common practice in publishing, even though it's a little bit unrealistic. Um, commercial publishers will, will require people to get permissions for public domain materials. So will you, be, will you go down that line, which is a, a fairly traditionalist line? Um, will you say you need, to show, you need to agree that you either have permission or you're using it in a way that is permitted by law? Um, that's kind of the line we tend to go down. Um, and in our case, as permitted by law, does include fair use. Um, whether you are going to embrace the idea that people can use stuff in your publications, perhaps without permission, this is where this is one of those points where your institution status matters a lot. You know, it's going to be easier to think about fair use if you are a nonprofit. It's going to be easier to think about fair use if there's no money involved. It's going to be easier to think about fair use if you're an educational organization, on down the line. Um, so your organizational status really matters here in terms of what kinds of rules for licensing you will impose. Um, finally, uh, I, I certainly hope that anybody who's doing library publishing is allowing use of open content, openly licensed content, but are there any Creative Commons licenses that you cannot accept? Um, I know that some people will not use uh, images or you know, third-party content that includes the non-commercial um, limitation. You, they won't use a Creative Commons image that has a, a non-commercial limitation if they are uh, selling copies of the publication. And that's kind of, a, a again, a local tolerance. What, what your decisions are may depend on what your institution is. Okay, so those are, those are Perhaps too quickly, um, kind of the issues involved in setting up a partnership with a group. And I am happy to entertain questions again through the chat box if people have them. I'm going to flip back across the slides quickly so that you can see um, kind of what we covered here. When you're setting up a partnership, you should have a memorandum of understanding. It should cover some degree of how you and the partner will share their copyrights. Um, it w should to some degree cover how authors who are not part of the organization that you're partnering with will deal with transferring rights or giving licenses. And it may need to deal with allocation of risk. All of those things are um, important things to talk about at the partnership level. And I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box. So hopefully that means this is all perfectly clear. Except I know that does not mean that because it's copyright, so it's not perfectly clear. Um, okay, on to authors. We are, at this point, I mean to, to talk about specifically individual authors or maybe a couple of people, individuals who are working together to produce a single work. So this could be um, somebody who's writing a book, somebody who's using your publishing 
platform to do some kind of new um, new model scholarship, but something where it's it's more of a one-to-one -one relationship. Your library publisher is working with an individual author. Um, if you're working with this individual author through some partner organization, hopefully you've already dealt with any necessary copyright issues in the service level agreement with your partner organization. When you are working with an author individually, your publishing group working with an individual author, uh, a lot of the same questions will, will be relevant as would be relevant in the partnership situation. So you might be doing service level agreements with individual authors. That's probably going to be a little bit intimidating for individual authors, so you might choose not to use the same document for an individual as you would for a group. Um, relatedly, individual authors are even less likely to be able to do things like provide indemnification. Um, I mean, they, they might be more likely to agree to it, but they're less likely to actually ever be able to pay for anything out of pocket that you couldn't pay for. So, uh, you know, there are some things that you would talk about with a group, a partnership group, that you would not necessarily want to dig, a, dig into with an author. It probably isn't worth raising. Um, so I'm seeing allocation of risk. Who's at risk if a copyright owner challenges a fair use by an author, i.e. the author gives a Creative Commons license or other non-exclusive license to the library publisher who puts the work and fair use content in an online journal? Uh, correct me, uh, question asker. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about, oh, that's Matt Ruin. Hi. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, an article of some sort, something like that, that includes, say, a photograph that belongs to someone who's not the article author, and they have given you the copyright to the article, and the person who owns the copyright in the photograph is uh, making a fuss. Yeah, an article with a graphic used under fair use. I, I'm seeing confirmation of that. Um, okay, so uh, depending on the guarantees, that you have put in place in your service level agreement, it will actually that will actually affect who might be um, at risk here, and that's why you why you put them in your service level agreement. Um, if there are no other legal agreements, all of you could be liable. Um, everybody who's involved, because the author made copies, and the organization that is running the journal, you know, might have might have had some uh, ability to write an ability to control that use, and you as the publisher are now distributing the material. Um, so without an agreement, everybody's at risk. Uh, with an agreement, you can shift risk, but shifting risk can make people feel bad. So sometimes it's not worth it to do that kind of shifting up, up ahead of time, especially in the Library Publishing Coalition. You know, we, we don't tend to be people who are, who are doing uh, hugely risky projects with lots of money involved um, and lots of the people we work with don't have lots of money. So trying to shift risk among people who don't have lots of money is not necessarily a worthwhile effort for anybody. Um, it's also worth noting the way this question was asked. Uh, an author who gives a Creative Commons license to a journal in a work that includes an image that's used under fair use has not given the journal any rights in the image. Um, the author doesn't own any rights in the image and therefore cannot give the journal any rights in the image. The author who gives you an article that includes third-party content, third-party images, can only give a license to their own work. And I have more to say about that in a little bit. And since we're already running a little late, I'm going to skip getting into more detail here. But thank you for a really good question. Um, and it's relevant totally relevant to the, um, the question of working with individual authors too. So all of that stuff about risk allocation and who, whether it's worth discussing when nobody's going to be able to indemnify anybody anyway, all of that is, is, is relevant. Um, I see another question, but I'm going to finish talking about these individual author issues and then I will look at the question. So um, when you're working with an individual author, something for your organization as a library publisher to think about is um, will you be doing anything that is a work for hire? And a work for hire is a very specific legal thing. It means that you are hiring someone to produce a particular thing for you, 
And because of that hiring relationship, and also sometimes it needs a contract, um, the work will never belong to the author. In a work for hire, it does not start out belonging to the author. It starts out belonging to who whoever has hired it. Uh, I don't know how many library publishers are commissioning works, but this is something that some uh, more traditional academic publishers do already do. You commission someone to produce a particular work. Um, there are some implications both legally and relationship wise when you set out an agreement where the where the actual meaning of the agreement is that the copyright never belongs to the creator. Creators don't tend to like that. Um, but there are some times when it's important to do that. Uh, also in passing, federal government employee authors don't have a copyright in their article because it's already public domain. So you don't need a license. You probably do need to think about how you will communicate about that, uh, both internally and perhaps with people who are reading your publication. Now I'm going to look at this other con this other other comment. Hillary Corbett, we use the same kind of language in our journal publishing memorandum of understanding that we do for a deposit in our repository. The author or depositor warrants that they have all necessary permissions, and we do not take responsibility. So. Um, that kind of that kind of agreement is is I would say the standard way to approach. I'm giving you something, and I promise that it all belongs to me, or I have the right to use it. Um, the we do not take responsibility side of it. Um, that is actually what I mean in terms of things like indemnification. Um, it's normal to ask people to promise that they've got all the rights they need. Um, it is perhaps less useful sometimes, it's going to really depend on the situation, perhaps less useful to try to contractually agree that it's not your responsibility because the contract is only vaguely useful. Um, a contractual agreement that would be more useful would be a contractual agreement that they will indemnify you, um, that, they will, that they will pay if a legal issue arises. But as I was saying before, that is something that can be difficult in terms of a relationship management with an individual author or with or with a publishing group. So who has the responsibility? It's okay if your contract addresses that, but um, if it comes up in court, if somebody actually decided to sue, the fact that your contract says you're not responsible will not control whether you are responsible or not. A court might say, it doesn't matter, you should have noticed that was Bugs Bunny uh, and you should have had a license. So. I'm going to come back to fair use a little bit later. Um, so hopefully there will be more questions, more comments then. In fact, I'm going to come back to fair use pretty much right away here. So, um, so I talked about agreements with individual authors. Now I'm talking about issues related to con third party content. So what do you allow slash require with respect to permissions, licenses, public domain material? Um, I mentioned before that you might choose to, in your service level agreement, you might say that people need to have permission or believe that they are already permitted by law. Um, in the case of the University of Minnesota Library Publishing, that does usually mean that we allow them to, to claim fair use on things, to, and partly because of our institutional affiliations and, and status. Um, we're not super worried uh, that we will not be able to defend a fair use case. We're an educational nonprofit institution. All of the publications that we work with are scholarly and educational, and we, we have conversations with our authors and our journal editors and so forth to help them, help them understand what legitimate um, scholarly fair use of third party materials might be. Uh, if somebody you know, one thing that library publishing actually can offer that's a value over a traditional publisher is that we actually might be able to be more flexible with something like fair use um, because we are educational, we are nonprofit, we are et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we may be more able to allow authors to um, take, I, I don't think it's all that risky to say, I need to talk about this picture, so I'm going to reproduce this picture, but lots of commercial publishers have some worries and limitations there. Um, I actually chose this particular background image with all the little rubber duckies in it to highlight that third-party materials 
are extra complicated because when I look at this particular slide, the slide that's on your screen right now, um, I can see at least three layers of copyright and it results in at least five, I think, different owners of a copyright. So when I look at this slide, there is the fact that I put together these words and this picture in this orientation, and therefore there's some sort of copyright in what is on the slide and how we're talking about it today. There's also the copyright in the photograph of the ducks, but that's already dealt with. I know I'm allowed to use this photograph because it has a Creative Commons license. Cliff Johnson took the picture, he owns the copyright, he gave me the right to use it. Those two layers are dealt with. The layer that's not actually directly addressed today is there is at least a copyright in the Donald Duck pirate rubber duck back there. There's at least a copyright probably in the little duck with the sailor hat. There is at least a copyright in the duck with the orange and blue hat in the left corner of the screen. And then I actually don't know how copyrightable the rubber ducky general image is. It's so generic that I'm not sure there's any identifiable owner, but there is an ownership of the art materials in the picture. I know I'm allowed to use the picture. Am I allowed to use those ducks? I think so, but it actually can get more layered than that, depending on the areas in which you're gonna be engaging in publishing. Um, I do see sometimes things like pictures of Bugs Bunny with Creative Commons licenses, and you have to be the smart people here and come back to your authors and say, how is it that you think that the random owner of that website over there gave you a license to use Bugs Bunny? Um, on the other hand, maybe you don't need a license to use Bugs Bunny because they're using it in a way that's fair use. Okay, uh, how are we on time? Yeah, I'm gonna keep going pretty, pretty quick here and I apologize. Feel free to type in questions at any time. Um, one issue with respect to third parties is how you give credit. Credit is usually not legally required but as soon as you have a license agreement that addresses credit, and that includes a Creative Commons license, then you do have a legal obligation to do some sort of credits. So um, fair use doesn't necessarily require credit. Public domain doesn't require credit. Use with permissions that don't address credit doesn't necessarily require credit. Obviously, if you're working in the scholarly publishing realm, you're gonna wanna give credit because that's an important ethical obligation in the scholarly world. Um, with respect to third-party licenses, sorry, third-party content, you may get takedown notices. Takedown notices are inappropriate legal tools for almost everything library publishing groups do. Um, takedown notices as a formal legal system only apply to unmediated user-generated content, like Facebook. Um, so, some, but, but the fact that they apply to things like Facebook means that people now use the form of a takedown notice to object to things where it's not technically legal, legally applicable. So one thing to think about as far as getting your copyright ducks in a row is what will you do if someone tries to tell you you need to take something down? And also where else in your organization might a takedown notice end up? Um, because often takedown responsibilities are formally allocated to um, in a uh, an information technology department of some sort, it's possible that there might be something that would happen where a takedown notice would actually get sent elsewhere in your organization uh, for content hosted by the library. Um, so something to think about is how will you respond and on, then also just to look out for whether there are other paths they might accidentally take. Finally, with respect to third party content, um, there are other legal moves somebody might make other than a takedown notice. They might send you a bill. They might send you a cease and desist letter. They might actually just launch a lawsuit against you. That's very unlikely, but it is something they could do. So um, almost any kind of legal complaint, I would suggest that you should probably not respond to without talking to your general counsel or talk ahead of time with your general counsel about how they want you to respond. Finally, I'm just going to squeeze in under the wire on time here. Um, one element of copyright that is worth thinking about is how you will communicate about copyright. You as a library publishing organization will communicate about copyright to the public. 
and I apologize for all the layering here, but um, there are a couple of images on the screen here. One is actually the, the biggest one that is furthest in the background is for a PLOS One article. And the PLOS One article, um, it took me a little while to find this actually because uh, I had to do a full text search for copyright because they didn't use the copyright symbol, but they didn't use the copyright symbol because um, this work is made available under the Creative Commons CC0 public domain dedication. So this this particular article is completely free of copyright. This is actually for public domain. And they've actually taken some effort to explain what that means. They've taken a moment to say this is an open access article free of all copyright and may be freely reproduced, distributed, transmitted, modified, built upon, or otherwise used by anyone for any lawful purpose. Um, the University of Minnesota Libraries Publishing, this is a screenshot example from our Open Rivers. Um, we have a statement that's on, I believe, every page that's part of that publication that says, except where otherwise noted, content on this site is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial 4.0 International License. And then just, as, just in passing, it seems to be a really common uh, practice, and I think it's a really good practice to have suggested citations with your, um, with your publication. So the PLOS publication here has one, and we have one that appears on our Open Rivers publication. And one last slide here. Um, when you are communicating with the public, sometimes you will be communicating with them about something where neither you nor anybody in your organization owns the rights. So that's why our um, Open Rivers statement says, except where otherwise noted, content is licensed under a Creative Commons license. Where otherwise noted is usually with an image, and that's what these last two um, images here are. These are screenshots of different ways that photographs are credited in the Open Rivers publication. So um, the credit of the photograph says, photographer Kelly McGinnis, courtesy of Bluestem Communications. To my mind, that communicates that this is not part of what's covered by the overall Creative Commons license on the publication, uh, the Open Rivers publication. But it is true that there are people who will be confused by that. Um, it's quite traditional, even in uh, traditional paper print commercial publications, when an image is included inside of a book that belongs to a third party, it's fairly tradition to, traditional to say something like courtesy of and whoever gave permissions. That is the traditional way of indicating that it doesn't belong to the same set of copyrights as the book publication. Um, the final image here is a, a screenshot of a Creative Commons image used in Open Rivers. Photographer Wally Gobitz image used under Creative Commons license CC, BY, and C, and D. So those are ways to indicate that third, the, the copyright status of third-party materials. There are totally other ways to do it. We're not, the, uh, we're not the best. I just think those are good ways of doing it. And I also am very proud of the work that my colleagues have put in getting that publication launched. So um, sorry for all the weird mix up in the middle there. If people have questions, feel free to throw them up there. Um, I guess we could try doing them out loud if you want. Feel free to follow up with me in email separately, anything like that. I will be here for a few more minutes. Hi, Nancy. This is Meredith. I have a question. Yeah. Um, something that we've seen come up a number of times in our publishing program is related to uh, rights that are necessary to, to make our journal content available via indexing and abstracting services. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that just, just for a moment? Because I know that's the question many other people have as well. Yeah, um, that's a question that gets, that gets, that's both simple in some ways and gets complicated very quickly. Um, what the indexing and abstracting st services want and need as rights um, may vary. If they're really just abstracting from your publication, and this is me speaking in you know copyright theory abstract world, not the practical world. If they're really just pulling abstract information from your publication, there isn't a copyright in the fact that J.S. so-and-so is the author of an article. There isn't a copyright in that. Um, and so they don't necessarily need permission to do that. Similarly, if the, all the material is already Creative Commons licensed, they don't really need permission to do that on a purely theoretical level. That doesn't mean they're not going to want 
permission to do that. So um, this is not an area where I actually have that much background. Uh, I would be very interested to hear what kinds of things you're the indexing and abstracting services are asking for you to be able to do. Um, as I understand it, the agreements that we have set up with our partners and our authors cover any kind of rights that we need in order to index and in order in order to make agreements with indexers and abstractors. But um, but I would be very interested to hear if people are running into problems there. Yeah, and this might be a great conversation for the LPC listserv. I'm mm -hmm. hoping that, that we've hit time. So I uh, I know just to be conscious of people's schedules, um, I want to thank Nancy uh, for today's webinar and to thank you all for attending. Um, just a quick reminder, we have another webinar scheduled. Uh, the next one is scheduled for February 17th at 4 p.m. Eastern, and that's with Alex Garnett uh, from Simon Fraser University, uh, and he'll be talking about PKP's XML parsing service. So I look forward to, to seeing you all on February 17th. Uh, but thank you again, Nancy, for such a great informative um, and duck-filled presentation. Um, I imagine we all have to duck out now. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for picking up that joke and running with it. All right, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye.